Hello and welcome to another edition of the Impossible State podcast at CSIS. My name is Victor Cha. I'm Senior Vice President for Asia and Career Chair at CSIS, Vice Dean and Professor at Georgetown. And we're very fortunate to have with us today Ankit Panda, our good friend Ankit Panda, who is the Stanton Senior Fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. For any of you who know anything or even remotely familiar with issues related to North Korea and North Korean weapon systems, you will know that Ankit Panda is, I don't know, how should we put it, the LeBron James of uh, North Korea when it comes to weapon systems and, uh, and their nuclear doctrine and strategic doctrine. He is the author of Kim Jong-un and the Bomb, Survival and Deterrence in North Korea, published by Hearst and Oxford in 2020. Uh, he was previously an adjunct senior fellow in the Defense Posture Project at the Federation of American Scientists and a member of their International Study Group on North Korea Policy. Um, he's been a Korea Society Kim Gu Fellow, a German Marshall Fund Young Strategist, a IISS Shangri-La Dialogue Young Leader, a Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs New Leader, um, and a widely published author uh, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and a number of other uh, journals and uh, and papers. He is editor at large of The Diplomat, where he hosts the Asia Geopolitics podcast, uh, and he is also a contributing editor to War on the Rocks. So, Ankit, really, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, and um, for our listeners, um, we're going to try to do a bit of a deep dive on North Korea, and in particular, uh, the latest uh, weapons and launches and demonstrations that they've done. Uh, Ankit, first, maybe we could start by talking a little bit about the most recent event, which was this um, failed effort at a military satellite launch. Before we get into this, the sort of technical details of this, um, why do they want to launch a military satellite? Like, what's the purpose of that? As opposed to, they've, they've tried to launch commercial satellites before, but what is the purpose of launching a military satellite? Well, first of all, Victor, thanks for having me, and sure. thanks for that very generous introduction. I think the big overarching reason North Korea wants this capability is very similar to why other states, primarily advanced states, seek this capability, which is strategic situational awareness, which is something that North Korea generally lacks. Uh, they rely on very outdated radar systems for air defense. Uh, they don't really have a good idea of what's going on too far away from their borders. And so to rectify this, they have identified uh, not just military reconnaissance satellites, but also new uh, unmanned aerial platforms to improve their strategic situational awareness. This has implications for their nuclear strategy. For instance, uh, this can uh, help them derive a sense of early warning in a crisis if they do fear that they are going to be attacked. They can verify whether, let's say, the United States is massing forces uh, in Northeast Asia. Conversely, they can also verify that we're not massing forces in Northeast Asia, which is interesting because that can have stabilizing implications if the North Koreans can use their own satellites to verify that. But then there's the more um, unsavory side of this, which is that the North Koreans are developing tactical nuclear weapons. And if they want to do targeting and damage assessment after they've carried out attacks, let's say, to verify if a target they struck was appropriately destroyed, that too will benefit from having an Earth observation capability. So there is really two sides to this. So in terms of that Earth observation capability, like how much do we know about how good they are with it? So that one thing is putting this thing into orbit, but what they have on the satellite, like how do we have a sense of, you know, how good are their cameras? How good are the, you know, compared to what we have in the West, in the United States, I mean, how, how good are their, are their capabilities in that regard? Do we know? We don't know the full scope of what they might have. We have seen what they've decided to show us to date. Uh, beginning in 2017, the North Koreans began strapping what appeared to be fairly high-quality DSLR camera optics. Basically, I would classify this as prosumer, kind of, if any photography enthusiasts are listening, they'll probably have a better idea. But they strapped some pretty rudimentary camera lenses to their um, missiles, primarily on the external side of the fairings, and they began beaming down images uh, to show that they had a ground link capability. These weren't satellite launches, these were just ballistic missiles. But they uh, broadcast images of the Korean Peninsula, of Japan, of Northeast Asia more generally. They've done this a number of times. Um, last year, they did broadcast an image of Seoul in black and white from what they said was the test of an optical satellite system. Now, the quality of that image was not great. So you had a lot of South 
Korean uh, defense experts who sort of poked fun at the North Koreans over this and said, you know, their military reconnaissance capability is going to amount to less than we can get from Google Earth. And then you got a really interesting statement from Kim Yo Jong, Kim Jong Un's sister, saying, "Well, we're not going to put the good stuff on our tests. We're going to save our better optics for when we actually launch a military satellite." So they have indicated that they have better optics. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see what they will come up with. Optics are not easy to build. Uh, there's this uh, nonlinearity to technological development. So a country that can build ICBMs might not be so good at building camera optics, which doesn't necessarily seem intuitive. But actually, the technological pathways are completely distinct. So a lot here, I think, will come down to what the North Koreans have been able to illicitly import uh, from overseas. Something like a camera lens, of course, like a DSLR lens, uh, isn't too difficult to bring into the country. Uh, but more advanced satellite optics are certainly going to be a uh, another level of technology. So I think we have to wait and see. So let me just pick up on something. I want to get to why it failed, right? The, but mm -hmm. let me get back to this earlier point that you made, the first point that you made, which is if they have this capability and it allows them to see what the United States and the South Koreans are, and the Jap potentially the Japanese are doing, it, th this counterintuitively, right, could have a stabilizing effect, right? In what sense? Can you explain how that? Can you explain to our listeners how that works? Sure. So a big part of the way the United States and uh, with our allies we message to North Korea about our joint military exercises is that they're defensive. We're not planning on attacking you. This is not a ruse. Um, assurances of that sort are really important in international politics. They're complementary to the deterrent signals we send Kim Jong-un, that if you use a nuclear weapon, we're going to hit you hard and potentially end your regime. But if you don't do anything, we're not going to attack you and our exercises are defensive. Now, for a country like North Korea that has a chronic sense of insecurity, those assurances are difficult to take on face value. Sure. But if the North Koreans have their own satellites above South Korea and above Japan potentially, and they can look to see we didn't just move a second carrier group into Yokosuka. We're not massing a bunch of F-35s on the Korean peninsula, or we're not moving other strategic assets out, uh, and we're not changing our military posture in a way that might be a prelude to an attack. That actually, I think, has an important effect on making our messages of reassurance to Kim in times of crisis a lot more credible. And so the reaction we've seen from officials is that this is a destabilizing act by North Korea. And I think that word gets used a little bit too loosely because now that North Korea does possess nuclear weapons in the scores, uh, we need to think more carefully about the kinds of uh, effects that its own developments might have. This reminds me of the late 1960s in the United States when you had Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara begin to worry about the survivability of the Soviet Union's nuclear forces, which seemed to a lot of people in the United States as a perverse thing for a U.S. Secretary of Defense to be concerned about. But McNamara, I think, understood at the time that the more secure the Soviets felt in their own nuclear capability, the less likely they would be to act rashly or potentially irrationally in a crisis. And I think very much these similar dynamics today are at play with North Korea. So another way of putting it is that if they had some sort of capability of this nature, it would reduce the potential sort of crisis instability situations where tensions are ratcheting up. They have no idea what the United States is doing or what, you know, what sort of, like you said, bringing a carrier, second carrier battle route st sort of steaming to the region. And it reduces the so-called use or lose in incentive that they might face in a unstable crisis situations. So that's, that's exactly right. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really, that's that's actually very interesting. And you're right, that's not, not the way we think about this. We usually think about it in terms of, oh, they're doing something else that's destabilizing. But but the other side of it is, yes, they could use it for other purposes as well, not just defensive. Let, can, can, let's get to this question of, um, um, so it failed, right? They were not able to, to put it in orbit. And they were pretty open about its failing. So what do we know about the failure of the launch vehicle? Yeah. So first of all, I think it's probably useful to describe what the launch vehicle sure, was, absolutely. right? So this was a multi-stage space launch vehicle. Uh, we were always expecting something with at least three stages, and we got that. It had a very large payload fairing uh, for any space nerds listening. It actually looks like a small version of SpaceX's Falcon 9. It's got that big kind of payload fairing on a skinny um, second and third stage with a very large uh, uh, lower stage, first stage, derived from the Hwasong-17 ICBM. Mm -hmm. uh, at least it appears to be based on a shortened version of that missile's uh, first stage. Um, the failure, uh, there's there's a couple theories out right now. South Korea's National Intelligence Service came out and they said that they believe the North Koreans tried to carry out uh, what's known as a yaw maneuver. Um, missiles will have th three primary modes of maneuver, yaw, pitch, and roll. Yaw is what helps a missile basically move laterally, and the North Koreans were likely trying to 
get this thing into orbit by changing the trajectory halfway to do what's known as a dogleg maneuver. So that's what NIS thinks went wrong. They tried to do that maneuver. It didn't work well because the thrust vectoring, which is what helps the missile kind of maneuver, uh, probably didn't work well. Uh, I think that might be the case, but also I think we have some evidence that potentially there's a simpler explanation, which is that simply the second stage uh, failed to ignite or um, failed halfway through uh, burning out because the South Koreans did manage to uh, locate the debris. They didn't actually fully retrieve it because it ended up sinking to the bottom of the ocean, but they located debris that appeared to be floating which might suggest that some of the fuel had burnt out, and it appeared to be the second stage of the missile. So this is a very normal failure mode for a multi-stage rocket of any kind. Uh, it's one that uh, we we should expect to see more in North Korea. We don't really see this a lot with their ICBM program, and that's quite interesting. Um, but here they seem to have run into this um, fairly predictable failure mode. They released a statement very quickly on the same day, which uh, I've actually, I don't recall seeing that with regard to any of their missile tests. It's usually at least the next day mm. that they'll comment publicly. But this time it was less than a day. They acknowledged what went wrong and they said they would try again. Uh, and so that's what we know so far about the failure. And and so this failure you're saying is sort of, it. it's, this is, what I'm understanding from you is this is not, this is a hurdle, but it's not a significant technological hurdle for them. Second stage failure is something we often see with these sorts of launches. Um, when they put a commercial satellite into orbit several years ago, or more than several years, like over a decade, they failed a number of times before they actually got it right. Yeah. Um, what was that? Was that a launch failure as well, or what was that? What was that about? So that was a payload insertion failure, which uh, s space is hard, right? Uh, inserting an orbit, uh, inserting a satellite into orbit is extremely difficult. So the North Koreans could still run into additional hurdles when sure. they do go back to launching this thing. Um, in 2012, they launched in April, and then they waited eight months, and they launched again in December. And the December launch uh, claimed to have been a success, although the payload ended up tumbling after they did insert it into orbit. Mm. In uh, February 2016, uh, with the Kang Myung-sung-4 satellite, they successfully inserted that. It didn't appear to tumble, but the North Koreans never really reported on any imagery from that satellite. So as far as we know in the open source, that satellite was inserted, but either it lost control with ground stations or it simply failed. It, it, it doesn't appear to have done anything useful mm -hmm. for uh, North Korea. I think they at some point claimed that it was broadcasting uh, songs. Revolutionary playing, playing, hymns. Yeah, revolutionary <laughs> hymns to Kim Il-sung. So uh, perhaps that is what it was meant to do all along. Um, but with this latest launch, I think... Um, the failure we saw uh, is one we might expect to see, but that's not to say that when the North Koreans do go back, they won't experience another failure, because what they're trying to do is something very few countries have done. They're trying to insert an Earth observation satellite into what's known as sun-synchronous orbit. Uh, this is something that you know South Korea has been working to do. They want to launch their own optical satellites as well. So there is a bit of an inter-Korean competitive angle to this as well, which mm -hmm. I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that the North Koreans... Um, may succeed at for a few launches. And I think they're open about this, uh, given their openness about the nature of this failure. I think they recognize what they're trying to do is a capability that's accessed by a fairly small number of countries. But they've identified it as a critical national defense priority as part of the ongoing five-year plan of modernization. And so my estimate is that they will stick to this and we will see another attempt, uh, probably a number of months. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we always talk about how opaque North Korea is and they're opaque about their COVID situation. They're opaque about how their inner politics is, uh, inner politics of the regime is run, but they're not very opaque about their weapon systems and what they're trying to do. They've been pretty clear about what they're trying to do. But this was on the list of things that they, uh, they announced in that New Year's speech a couple of years ago, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And I think there's a lot more ambition to their space program than we realize at the moment because uh, what's really interesting is uh, Sohei, the 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 newer space launch site in North Korea. They've they've long abandoned the East Coast site. Um, that site is undergoing a lot of refurbishment yeah. that Kim Jong Un has specifically called for. That, of course, you, Victor, have looked at very closely and published uh, imagery on. Um, but the launch or uh, the launch that they carried out recently took place from a new launch pad right, uh, the on, one the, on coast. the coast. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So they have the main launch pad with the gap uh, with the yeah. gantry, and that raises an interesting possibility that they might actually have an all new space launch vehicle. Uh, because Kim, when he went to the National Aerospace Development Administration (NADA), uh, which is North Korea's uh, organization, uh, you know their counterpart to NASA, to say, uh, basically. 
Uh, Kim called for um, satellite launches that could insert multiple satellites at the same time into sun-synchronous orbit, right? Similar to what commercial firms like Planet do for their uh, Earth observation satellites. And so that, I think, speaks to the remarkable ambition here. Will they go ahead and do that? Uh, I don't know. Mm. In 2017, uh, a visiting Russian uh, researcher went to Pyongyang. He talked to NASA scientists, and they expressed uh, aspirations to launch satellites into geostationary orbit, so for telecommunications potentially. So the, these ambitions, I think, might go much deeper than we might expect at the moment. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we, for instance, saw a much larger North Korean space launch vehicle uh, that did make use of the traditional launch gantry that continues to be refurbished at Sohei. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, yes, Joe, Joe Bermudez and his team have been reporting on all the work being done at Sohei. Uh, but, so what do we know about this new launch pad on the, on the East Coast? I mean, initially, we, there was some confusion as to whether they launched from the old launch pad or the new one, and... Um, uh, we initially thought it was from the old one, but they actually came out and said that it was it was the new one. Do is do we know anything about that? Like, what do we know about that launch pad um, that is that might be different from what we've seen so far at Sohei? Well, so it's a completely different kind of mechanism. It appears to have uh, an erector mechanism that that lifts the launcher up. So it's probably good for launchers of about the size that we saw with uh, with the Cholima One launcher, which, by the way, is is, is the name. I should have mentioned yeah, that right. earlier. Um, and, and there's an interesting implication here, which is that if they do have the ambitions that I think they do, having these two workable launch sites not too far from each other actually allows them to parallel process a lot of this, right? So they might be concurrently working on a separate launch uh, that might take place in a number of weeks or months uh, from the main gantry while they optimize this particular launch site for let's say, Cholima-1 class launchers. If this is going to be a series that the North Koreans are going to commit to, um, then it would make sense to have multiple launch sites where they can uh, operationalize uh, two separate programs. And do we know if this was uh, uh, solid propellant or liquid propellant? We do. Uh, so from the images, we can see that it's a pretty traditional-looking liquid. Uh, liquid propellant, mm -hmm. um, uh, first stage at least. We don't have any information on the upper stages. Mm -hmm. uh, hybrid stages are possible. It's also possible the North Koreans might have uh, started to use cryogenic propellants, although we don't have evidence of that just yet. Uh, cryogenic uh, propellants are widely used in space launchers. They're not as desirable for ballistic missiles because of the, they have to be stored mm -hmm. at fairly uh, low temperatures, hence the term cryogenic. Um, but the the first stage does appear to be uh, the four-chamber uh, Hwasong-17 ICBM first-stage engine. Mm -hmm. So it's an engine they have substantial experience with uh, that they've flight-tested now uh, at least eight times, uh, more if you count the other configurations in the 15 and the 14 and the 12, uh, which are all in the same family. Uh, so they are fairly well acquainted here. And this actually raises the um, the old question that we used to ask about North Korean space launches, which is, how much of this is a fig leaf for them to expand their ICBM ambitions? And, you know, that's been a part of the critique we've heard from governments uh, after North Korea's latest space launch. But the problem set is a little bit different now. Uh, for instance, in the old days, we worried that the Unha launchers would help them get to an ICBM. But when they eventually tested an ICBM, the engines they used, the technologies they uh, used for that ICBM were completely separate from what they tested in their space launch program. And now, of course, they've launched far more ICBMs than they have ever launched space launch vehicles. So I think the linkage there is is, is more tenuous than it's been in the past. Um, there are still, of course, some linkages with multi-stage missiles generally, but the North Koreans have now years of experience uh, with multi-stage missiles in general. So yeah, so I actually, when you talk about the distinction between the Unha and the Hwasong series, this gets like to the question of how did they become so good at this? I mean, there was a period of time, as you remember well, where they were trying and they were failing, they were trying, they were failing. It led to a lot of ridiculing mm. of North Korea. And even when they were successful at launching something, you'd have um, um, not so much experts, but folks in the government who were allowed to speak would say, oh, well, they're still way behind. This is very primitive, so on and so forth. Uh, the Puguk Song series didn't seem to do very well. Right. And now all of a sudden this Hwasong series is very successful. So how do we how do you explain? How do you account for that? You know, what's the difference in terms of what they're doing? And then are, are they getting help? Who are they getting help from? Yeah, so uh, the North Koreans are very capable, but they're not unique geniuses when it comes to um, testing and developing missiles. So we do see an unusual level of success when it comes to some of their more complex programs and systems. Uh, and we know that they have received help from outside, uh, right? They received help from the AQ Khan network for their uranium enrichment program. 
They received several out of work and underemployed Soviet scientists at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. There's a famous case where about 90 Soviet scientists were interdicted at the Moscow airport in the early 1990s on their way to Pyongyang with one-way tickets, mm -hmm. which raises the question of how many weren't interdicted that have been living potentially in Pyongyang for 30 plus years now, mm -hmm. helping uh, the North Korean Academy of Defense Science with their missile endeavors. Uh, North Korea has... Um, what might be called consortium uh, arrangements with Iran and Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan might not be current, but in the past, uh, missiles like the Nodong, which North Korea transferred to these countries, uh, the Nodong was flight tested just a handful of times in North Korea. Uh, but the North Koreans made it an important backbone of their early nuclear force. And uh, one of the things that I at least discovered when I was writing my book was that the Iranians and the Pakistanis likely transmitted some flight testing data back to North Korea when they were iterating on the Nodong uh, within their own borders. Uh, Iran-North Korea ballistic missile cooperation continues to this day. Uh, we know this from fairly recent U.S. Uh, Treasury sanctions, for instance, that have designated uh, Iranian entities for cooperating with North Korea. Uh, the upper stage engine of the Hwasong-14, and I suspect Hwasong-15 ICBM, are derived from Iranian space launch technology. Mm. Uh, so there are several linkages here. Um, that said, uh, we also know that the North Koreans, uh, out of necessity, because in order to sustain and steward a nuclear deterrent, you have to have the ability to indigenously keep this program going. So for many of their critical um, technologies, like the the engine that I was just talking about that powered the space launch vehicle is based on the Soviet uh, engine known as the RD-250. And uh, it's, it's my assessment that the North Koreans have largely managed to indigenize the production process for this. They might still require a few components from overseas, but to the extent possible, they're able to produce this internally. Um, I think we saw evidence of this at the uh, Self-Defense Expo in October 2021 when they had a completely separate RD-250 engine assembly that looked to be brand new sitting in the middle of that assembly hall uh, alongside all of their missiles. They call this the March 18th Revolution engine. It is one of their most proud accomplishments. In fact, they talk about this engine in a way that they don't talk about other propellants, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, other engines, including their solid propellant engines. Um, with the solid propellant program, I think there are still unanswered questions about where some of the technology assistance might have been coming from. The new Hwasong-18, the first solid propellant ICBM ever tested by North Korea, uh, looks remarkably like the Russian Topol-M, mm -hmm. uh, right? And, and we know about several transfers of, of knowledge and blueprints from the Soviet Union to North Korea. So it's quite possible that the Topol-M, which was deployed in the mid-90s but was under development when the Soviet Union collapsed, some of those plans might have made it over uh, and might have been sitting in North Korea for 30 years, only to be operationalized now. Mm. So there are unanswered questions. There are mysteries here. Uh, the answers to this, I think, will take a long time. Um, but we know in general terms that the North Koreans aren't doing everything they've done all on their own. Mm, yeah. So in a sense, the, the, uh, their missile program really is the, is, is the, is the result of a reflection of a transnational network of different actors and plans and unemployed scientists and others who've found their way um, into helping North Korea. That is, but I also don't want to give the impression that by tamping down on those transnational networks that we can fully choke off North Korea's continuing missile programs. That, that I think, uh, you know, we actually see this with um, the KN-25, which is a 600-millimeter short-range ballistic missile. In September, 20, uh, in September 2019, at one of the early tests of the KN-25, uh, Kim Jong-un basically pointed out that the KN-25 that was tested that day was built entirely by a young generation of North Korean missile scientists. You know, they've got a young professionals program, basically, when it comes to their ballistic missiles. So he's, he's very keen on indicating that they are, uh, they are stewarding and encouraging the human resource development in North Korea that will allow them to take the knowledge that they have received from external sources, make it their own, and, and sort of forge ahead as necessary. Very, very classically North Korean when it comes to their definition of what self-reliance really means. So they get the information, they iterate on it, and then they're self-reliant going forward. And I think that'll be the case for most of their endeavors. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked about Russian cooperation, Iranian cooperation, in the past, Pakistani cooperation, maybe transferring flight data from that first generation of ballistic missiles. What about China? What do we know about any Chinese cooperation with North Korea? We know well, a few things. Missile I mean, engines. Well, yeah. on missile engines, there's less. Uh, there were, in the Cold War, um, direct missile transfers from China to North Korea, but those didn't end up really going anywhere. The North Koreans ended up primarily using the Soviet origin Scud as the basis for um, most of their missile programs. Um, most recently, uh, in, in 2010, uh, in, in Kim Jong-il's final days, the North Koreans imported 
six large logging trucks from China under falsified end user licenses, where they told the Chinese that they were going to use them for forestry. And then at a military parade in 2012, we saw those same forestry trucks converted to carry uh, what at the time was North Korea's first mocked up ICBM uh, for uh, Kim Il-sung's uh, centennial at the time. Um, in, in recent years, we see less evidence of direct Chinese technology analogs in North Korea. Um, but China, of course, being North Korea's largest land border for, for cross-border trade, continues to be an important conduit for components, including semiconductors, some of those things we talked about earlier, like optics for potential satellites. Those are likely coming through the PRC border as well. Uh, so China does play an important role in the overall uh, ability for North Korea to import these capabilities. But when it comes to the technologies we see specifically for their missiles, uh, we don't see too many direct analogs with, uh, with Chinese technology. Mm. Um, and so I guess the next question to me is, uh, you know, we've had this very sort of robust discussion about their, their, what they're trying to do with this program, the SOHE la uh, launch failure. Like, what do you think is next? Uh, as we were talking about just before we came on air, we're outside the launch window now for that they had initially declared. Um, do you think they're going to try again? Um, or, or, or do you think uh, everybody's still waiting for the shoe to drop on the seventh nuclear test. What do you, what do you think is coming next? Yeah, so those are the two big ones that I basically agree are, are coming at some point in the sense that we have strategic warning, Victor, but we don't necessarily have tactical warning uh, right. in that, you know, right. we're, we're just likely to wake up one day or probably sit down for dinner here in Washington to a nuclear test and that'll be that. Um, let me start with the nuclear test because there's something really odd about the way in which North Korea introduced the Hwasan-31, their new tactical nuclear warhead which is that for the first time, uh, you know, we've seen three such demonstrations by Kim Jong-un where he inspects a warhead. He did this in March 2016. He did this in September 2017. Or rather, I should say, state media released images of him doing this on those dates. And at the time, uh, the units we saw, it was a single unit. It was Kim alone with no people in military uniform around him. Uh, and then eventually, uh, in the case of March 2016, they just tested in January. And in the case of September, they literally tested a few hours after KCNA broadcast those images. The demonstration of the Hwasan-31 this year was really interesting because they had serially produced this warhead. They had about 12 in the room with Kim Jong-un when he was inspecting it. He was accompanied by uniformed members of the KPA, which made sense because last year at the Central Military Commission, they were talking about giving tactical nuclear weapons to frontline units. Um, but you wouldn't see really produce something that you intended to test, uh, right? The idea would be you test first, you see if the thing works, and then you begin producing it at scale. So the North Koreans have produced this at scale, which raises an interesting question about their upcoming nuclear test, which is, are they going to demonstrate the Hwasan-31, or will it be potentially another design? Uh, it wouldn't be completely crazy for the North Koreans to have a second design for a tactical nuclear weapon. There's various uh, reasons to do that if they want to more optimally use their limited stockpiles, uh, plutonium especially. If they're using things like blended pits, for instance, they might choose to... Uh, experiment with another design. They might be very confident in the Hwasan-31 and perhaps don't need to test it. Um, mm. The space launch program, uh, I think, is in an interesting position now. Uh, so North Korea first launched in 1998 when they launched the Taepodong-1. They did not pre-notify that. So it was a bit of a surprise. But beginning in 2009, they started pre-notifying to the International Maritime Organization uh, and to the International Civil Aviation Organization concerning their space launches. And part of the reason they did that was to completely distinguish it from their military activities. They insisted that they had a sovereign right to space launches, that these were peaceful activities. And I was wondering if they would do the same with this overtly military reconnaissance capability. And they did. They notified the IMO. What's been really interesting in the last few days is that the IMO, after this launch, uh, uh, carried out a resolution condemning North Korea. And the North Koreans, in reaction to this, um, there was a commentary uh, not attributed to Kim Yo-jong, attributed to, I think, one of those classic pen names that you get in the North Korean system, Kim Yong-chol, I think. And uh, this commentary said, because of the IMO's resolution, North Korea would not pre-notify, uh, or felt that it did not need to pre-notify concerning its next space launch. Which is unfortunate, because, you know, insofar as the North Koreans do try to behave somewhat responsibly, I think it's good, all things considered, that they do pre-notify because these launchers do have large drop zones, including near the Philippines, where you mm -hmm. actually do have a fair bit of maritime traffic. Uh, so this does set up, I think, a dangerous precedent now where North Korean space launches might be about to occur in greater numbers than they've ever occurred in the past, and we might not get pre-notification. Um, 
How long will they take to iterate, I think, is another interesting question. Uh, we've seen a range of values for this. Uh, I talked a bit about 2012, and it took them a little more than seven months to come back and, and successfully launch after the April 2012 failure. Uh, in July uh, 2017, when they first launched the Hwasong 14, it was a success, but they actually did iterate. They changed a few things about the second Hwasong 14 that they launched later that month on July 28th. So they can iterate very quickly, uh, but they can also take several months. Uh, it's really unclear what they'll do here. If it was a stage separation failure, I think that is something that would lend itself to fairly quick iteration. Mm. If it was something more complicated, as NIS thinks, with the yaw maneuver not working, that might take a longer process to sort of go back and, and reevaluate what went wrong. But I think what we can say with a, a high degree of certainty is that they will be back to launch another um, another satellite. Yeah, and the window doesn't seem to the window doesn't seem to matter anymore because they're not going to pre-notify. Exactly, we're at anymore. the end of the window already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to the nuclear, I mean, this is interesting that the fact that, I mean, that he allowed himself to be pictured with uh, not just all of this military brass around him, but these, uh, in scale, these, the Hwasong 31. Um, do you think it's possible that they could have tested this and we just didn't know it? I mean, I guess the question is, can can they, is it possible for them to test a tactical nuclear device and are not being able to pick it up. So I have fairly high confidence that uh, seismic monitors uh, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization's international monitoring system would detect any man-made nuclear explosion of significant yield. Uh, that said, uh, what's really interesting about your question is that when Kim Jong-un back in April 2018, uh, right before the summit with uh, former South Korean President Moon Jae-in, announced a moratorium on nuclear testing, for the first time, uh, he mentioned subcritical nuclear testing, mm -hmm. right, which is the kind of testing that uh, the United States and, this, uh, and Russia and, and China, all of the nuclear states carry out routinely to maintain their warheads, carry out experiments. So these are not uh, tests that result in a full supercritical nuclear yield. Uh, they are the exact opposite, subcritical by their very nature. There's also hydrodynamic testing. Uh, and my guess is that the North Koreans um, mentioned this for a reason, which is that they, they wanted us to know at the time that even though they were ceasing nuclear testing as a show of good faith to engage in diplomacy, they were serious about stewarding their nuclear warheads and their nuclear stockpile going forward. So that kind of experimentation has continued. Uh, we've had a few press reports citing, I think, officials in Japan about high explosives testing at Yongduktong, which is where the North Koreans have been carrying out. Uh, detonator testing for nuclear warheads going back to the 1990s. Uh, so that activity has been continuing. Um, but if they did detonate something under Mount Mantap, which is one of the most closely watched nuclear test sites in the world, um, I'm fairly certain that we would know that there had been a man-made nuclear explosion. What's interesting, though, Victor, is if they are going for a lower-yield tactical nuclear weapon, mm. um, their claims to credibility, I think, are going to be a little bit more challenging than they were in the past. Because in the past, we knew they were trying to get bigger and bigger. So when we had a magnitude 5.8 event under Mount Montop on September 3rd, 2017, the whole world knew that this was a large nuclear device. It was the largest the North Koreans had ever detonated. Now if they carry out a, let's say, 5 kiloton detonation under Mount Montop, um, there might be a debate about, well, did that fizzle or was that their intended design yield? The North Koreans have told us a lot about their tactical nuclear weapons plans. They've told us about delivery systems. They've shown us the warhead that they intend to put on those delivery systems. They've even told us about doctrine. Mm. What they haven't told us about is their intended yield. And that actually matters quite a bit for in terms of what to expect out of a test and even how to model potential tactical nuclear weapons use scenarios on the Korean Peninsula. There's a big difference between North Korea using multiple 5 kiloton warheads versus 15 kiloton warheads uh, in terms of the number of warheads they'd have to assign to certain military targets in South Korea, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that's something I'm watching for to see if we get more clarity on. And then, and so I guess we're we're getting close to time. So let me just ask you on that on that point: five versus fifteen kilo. So how, if you had, like, how would you, how would how would you assess their thinking about this in terms of the the use of sort of tactical nuclear weapons like in term do they see it as something in which they can control they see it as something that allows them to control the escalation ladder or they see it obviously if they just have their you know really um sort of poorly trained conventional military and then they have these big nuclear weapons on the other hand there isn't much of an escalation ladder and it creates a very unstable situation where they're you know they are forced to, to, to move up the ladder very quickly. I mean, what what is the, how would you assess their thinking with regard to tactical nuclear weapons and the escalation ladder? 
Yeah, so I think I think the way I describe it is they're basically trying to flesh out their existing nuclear strategy. I don't think there's been a fundamental change to North Korea's nuclear strategy throughout much of the Kim Jong Un era, at least. Uh, they've they've been they've had sort of a clear through line, and their capability development has been sort of missing pieces for the jigsaw puzzle, right? So in 2017, when Kim Jong Un watches the Hwasong 15 fly and he says, "My deterrent is complete," I think what he was saying was he had a minimum viable product. But he didn't have the full thing uh, because um, the fundamental point on tactical nuclear weapons is North Korea is basically borrowing from NATO's playbook in the 1960s. In fact, it's really remarkable. The North Koreans do this thing where they borrow language from U.S. US nuclear posture reviews and um, from um, NATO documents basically almost verbatim. Uh, and, and they talk about what they're going to do with these things, which is that they're going to use tactical nuclear weapons to degrade a conventional invasion of their territory. Uh, that might include using tactical nuclear weapons on their own territory if, let's say, U.S. and South Korean mechanized divisions have crossed the 38th parallel. Or it might include initiating tactical nuclear strikes against ports, airfields, command and control nodes in South Korea to degrade the ability of the alliance to carry out high-intensity conventional military operations. And then how does Kim expect to survive once he's done that? Because we keep telling him that if he uses any nuclear weapons, it's the end of his regime. Well, that's where the numbers come in. Uh, he's got a much larger and more diverse nuclear force than he's ever had. Uh, we can debate the exact numbers, but anywhere between 40 to 100 warheads, pretty big error bar there, but 40 to 100 strikes me as about the right ballpark. Um, and if he uses, let's say, 20 to 30 tactical nuclear warheads, he's got some in reserve. Um, he basically has been trying to signal over the last two years that his capabilities are going to be survivable enough, responsive enough, hidden in enough places under lakes, in rail cars, in road mobile launchers, in the forest, in the mountains, in drive through shelters, in silos. Tucked up, no, tucked up near the Chinese border. Tucked right? up near the Chinese border. Yeah. That if we want to continue that fight after Kim's already gone nuclear, we are risking Kim using nuclear weapons against cities including in South Korea and Japan, and against the U.S. homeland. And so Kim's theory of victory is he sees a war coming, he uses tactical nuclear weapons to stop the invasion, and he tries to terminate the conflict. And the other side of that coin is if we don't accept his offer to terminate the conflict, then the gloves are off, and that might mean nuclear retaliation against Seoul Metro, Tokyo Metro, Los Angeles, D.C., and that's the choice that I think Kim Jong-un is going to be asking Pot Rock and POTUS and the Prime Minister of Japan to have to make in a crisis. And it's a tough one. Uh, and I think there's fundamentally some very difficult conversations to be had about our declaratory policy. So I actually liked um, you know, the Washington Declaration, which was recently promulgated uh, during President Yoon's visit. Uh, had some carefully selected language, I thought, on this, right? Uh, the you know, President Biden said that we would end the regime, but in the Washington Declaration, it says that our response would be swift, effective, and overwhelming, uh, which actually is a good form of calculated ambiguity to, uh, to message towards North Korea. It's similar to how we've talked to Vladimir Putin about the consequences of nuclear use in Ukraine, which is that the administration has said that the consequences would be catastrophic. Uh, I think it's generally a bad idea to tell the adversary exactly what you might do under what conditions. And the unfortunate reality now is that there might be scenarios in which our interests might not be served by going all in for a regime-ending response after North Korea has used nuclear weapons. And that's a really uncomfortable uh, reality that we're heading towards. Uh, but I think we're already there, and I think it should raise some really tough questions for how we think about carrying out military operations on the peninsula and how we communicate to Kim Jong-un, uh, both regarding deterrence and that first thing we talked about today, which was assurance, how we communicate to Kim that he doesn't need to use nuclear weapons in the first place because we're never going to invade him, right? You and I both know this. Everybody in D.C. and Seoul knows this, that the United States and South Korea are not going to make an affirmative decision to initiate a war of aggression to overthrow the Kim regime out of the blue. So seeking stability uh, here, I think, will require a rethink of some of this. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I want to go back to something you said a minute ago, which is that, um, you know, one possible use for these tactical nuclear weapons would be on logistic no logistics nodes. Yeah to prevent, you know, the, the reinforcement, the flow of forces to the peninsula. I mean, arguably, the North Koreans could do that, could, could before they had tactical nuclear weapons, could do that with chemical weapons. And it was always a concern, like, can, can, can we fight in a, in, a, in a sort of contaminated environment? Um, it could be that the North Koreans feel like we can, right? That we we we, we would be able to fight in a, and be able to carry out operations in a contaminated environment. Therefore, that's one of the reasons why they go even further with tactical nuclear weapons. 
There was always a question of whether we would respond to a chemical attack with nuclear weapons. North Koreans probably think, yeah, they probably would. So um, we have to have, as you said, a survival capability to deter that. So on a number of different fronts, there are reasons why they would pursue these tactical nuclear weapons um, 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 and, and produce many of them, right, to, uh, uh, as you said, to, to create a stockpile of them so that they would, we would be deterred from acting. These, I think, in other very difficult questions will be part of this Washington, de- what the follow-on from the Washington Declaration, the nuclear consultative group, um, uh, and uh, some of the exercising, I think, that they, that they, they plan to do. Um, so let me, uh, just to finish, let me ask you, so which do you think is coming, which do you think will come next? Will it be a seventh nuclear test or will it be another effort to put uh, this military satellite into orbit or something else? Well, you know, I'm going to maybe hit you with a curveball, which is we have pretty good evidence now that they're going to do a uh, parade uh, for the 70th anniversary of the end of the Korean War, Victory Day on mm-hmm. uh, July 25th. Uh, there's uh, already satellite imagery showing parade prep uh, near the Marine Parade training grounds. Uh, and I think what we've seen, uh, especially in the pandemic years uh, and through to today, is uh, North Korea has started substituting parades uh, in a way for significant missile launches and even nuclear tests in a way. So the parade might actually take their foot off the pedal a little bit. Mm-hmm. If NADA does need months to reconstitute and reevaluate what went wrong with the space launch, we might not see anything until we see this parade. Uh, and if we do see something, it might be... Um, Perhaps after the parade, when our late summer uh, alliance exercises resume, they might carry out their short-range uh, missile testing uh, mm-hmm. or missile exercises, rather, as they as they have tended to do in recent years. So uh, that's that's kind of what I'm expecting at this juncture. Uh, but we're also, of course, heading into you know the Fourth of July uh, when they launched their ICBM first back then. So Kim might value um, launching a satellite around then to make a point to the United States. But um, I think, you know, we can sometimes overinterpret the value of those dates for North Korea. So I'm not going to put too much on that. So my bet is nothing's going to happen until the parade. Nothing big. Okay. Well, that, I'm sure that our, our, our friends who are working in the White House would be happy to hear that, to have a couple of weekends in which they weren't being called back into the office. Um, so Ankit Panda, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion, uh, this sort of deep dive on North Korea and what happened with the satellite military satellite launch. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, again, his book is called uh, Kim Jong-un and the Bomb, Survival and Deterrence in North Korea, published by Hearst and Oxford University Press. Uh, it's really great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot for having me, Victor. Great to do it. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching, uh, and we hope to see you on the next episode of The Impossible State.